Everybody loves a little gatekeeping. Is this gatekeeping or not? Junior De Go Devs. All right, let's find out. Here we go. It's a LinkedIn post, so immediately I have to say that it's probably going to be vacuous. But let's find out. All right. There is a big rise in Go plus you React full stack boot camps appearing in the internet in the last few months. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Hey, okay. I, I mean, at least I, I find that to be a positive thing. First off, my mom's not vacuous. Okay. This is a good place to go. Hey, at least, hey, we're getting Go. I'm not saying that I love React, but I'm saying at least the thing that I, if this statement is to be believed on face value, one thing I really like is that we are integrating languages that are designed with a specific purpose. And I think that that's really good. I think Go being a web server language makes it really nice to write web servers in. All right, this demonstrates that one, the world is starting to pay some serious attention to Go as a professional programming language, which will bring more developers of the language. It's already a pretty big developed language. Go, I think it's, Go has some pretty big serious contending as far as it goes. Um, I mean, sure, it's not gonna be as big as Java, but that's because Java, was the de facto language to write since like what 2004 2003 it started off in what 1994 and was co-released as J with javascript at the exact same time we read that way back in the day oh man that was so funny that's why we have null in javascript by the way is because javascript and java had to interrupt and that was one of the requirements is to have a null but you know so for for what two decades Java was uncontended on the back end as far as web stuff goes. You know, Go came out in what, 2011? So it's a, it's a, rel like by relative standards, it's a pretty new language and we're already seeing some pretty big waves by Java, right? Java applets on the front. End. I did do that. That's actually, so Java applets, to be completely fair, that's actually how I wrote my first game was on Java applets on the front end. Yeah. Yeah. There was also an explosion of like tech exploded in 2005, 2006 when the general internet got good. You're old. I am. Thank you. Applets, I do it. But, uh, you know, I loved it. That's actually how I did my physics homework in college is I would write games based on the physics homework I was learning so I could understand my physics homework. The fever of bad full stack developers that actually do kind of no go well or kind of no react well will soon rise a lot. I mean, to be completely fair, anytime you have a new market forming in which people are entering for the first time, there should be a lot of kind of no's. I mean, you don't really know a lot about programming until you've done. I mean, honestly, for me to get pretty good, it took about a decade. And so to kind of know something and kind of know something, that seems pretty, that's like, that seems completely reasonable. Like, how else do, how else do you start? There will be a lot of people I'll be denying in as in inter, uh, during interviews because they don't know what is the underlying type of slices and maps in Go. Also, I don't think that you needing to know this can make you an effective programmer or not. I think this makes a lot more sense if you're programming manual memory management than it does if you're not programming manual memory management. And the reason why I say that is that in Go, you don't really think a lot about your memory so slides or your memory size. And so you're not really thinking, oh, I'm going to pass this thing. Okay, what is it? Okay, I'm passing two system architecture with sized items. So therefore, it's better to copy those on the stack and then refer to something than it is to copy, say, the 40 bytes that would be this on the stack, maybe, right, with indirect access. Who knows, right? The GC just handles a lot. Like, there's no trade-offs you're making there. So, therefore, I just don't really feel like it's it's that important of a question, maybe. Um, but it's also probably good for me to know. It's just always good to know these things. Also, slices are really dangerous because slices you can mutate. I always, thought, I always found that to be a weird part about Go is that you have – the thing itself, right? The array or however it is. You make an array. I assume that's still a slice of some sort. And then you can create an offset, a slice into it. And then if you mute, mutate that and you get more memory, you can just start writing over into other areas. Always kind of a weird, always kind of just a weird design of Go in generally. Yeah, not arrays. They're lists, right? Lists. Lists. Not arrays. Arrays have the, arrays are defined length version. And let's see, and maps. I don't know what the underlying uh, structure of ma a map is or how they lay out the data. I would again assume if it's a map, um, a map is just in my head a giant contiguous region of memory in which you have a hash index into, in which there exists a linked list in here for the data. Or they could do exponential backoff slash linear backoff, but I don't know if it's that. So I just assume it's that associative array. Uh, well, that, an associative array is a PHP term. PHP, everybody, quickly, laugh at this man. He does PHP. Laugh at him.
That guy right there, look at him! Look at him, he does PHP! Anyways, sorry, I've never done PHP in my life. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Dude, don't, hey, dude, dude, just own it. Just own that. I'm kidding, also, PHP is great. I just wanted you to know, I actually, I actually like PHP. So, uh, I don't know what exponential back off is, and at this point, I'm afraid to ask. And, uh, so, so how, how this works, by the way, so generally how a map works is that a map uses a hashing algorithm modulo by the size of the contiguous memory region, right? So let's say this thing can hold 10 items. So it'd be, uh, you do your hash and then 10 items. And so it's gonna appear somewhere randomly within this array. Or let's pretend that this was already taken off or it has already been taken. So one of the older strategies of maps was to actually take this and then calculate, okay, I'm gonna do one step squared. So I'm gonna go to the next one. If that one's taken, I'm gonna do two steps squared. So I'm gonna do, you know, one, uh, see, we're gonna go one, two, three, four. I'm gonna go to right here. Okay, let's try to put this in. If we can't do that, then we're gonna do another big exponential. Then we're gonna do three steps squared. Whereas linear back off would be to, you know, check just linearly. And so then what you do when you retrieve something out, when you store something, you don't just store the item, you store the key plus the value. And so that way you can do a comparable on the key to make sure that you're actually accessing the correct item. That's basically how maps work. And I think nowadays what they use is they use a, a linked list inside of here. That's what I thought. Maybe I'm wrong on that one. Anyways, they use a linked list. Oh, why uh, sets are faster for includes? I don't know what you're talking about. It just depends, right? It depends. So if you're, if you're talking about what is faster, this is, a, this is one of those really funny phrases people say and they don't actually know what, what, what it means. When someone says something is faster, if you have a contiguous array of, say, 10 integers, all right, this will be faster than a set, even though it takes linear searching to be able to find the number you're looking for versus a set, which takes a constant time search. And that's because going through memory this way is really, really, really fast. And the comparisons of integers is really, really, really fast. Doing a lookup in a set involves complicated hashing algorithm, right? It, it involves comparing the key, right? So there's like a certain number that it actually starts to go the other direction. So uh, typically, I, I mean, I've found sometimes in JavaScript around like 30 items is where it starts to even out. Like if you have 70 items in your array, you should probably be using a set. If you have 10 items in your array, you should probably be do, uh, using a uh, an array or a list, really. Yeah, with 10 integers with SIMD, that's like, 10, yeah, that's an instant. So anyways, this is interesting. Let's see, in Go, uh, that actually don't know how to work with pointers and why that they don't know how to implement and use interfaces. And let's see, that they don't know that they don't write Go following the language style, et cetera. I think some of those questions were good, right? If you're, if you're writing Go and you're gonna get a job with Go, you should probably know what a pointer is. Like, that's pretty fair. That's a fair statement. If you don't know what a pointer is and you've been writing Go for six months, like, I do have some questions. Like, how, how, did, you, how did you get to this point? Like, that's very fair. Um, if you don't know how to implement and use an interface, that also feels kind of weird. Right, like you've been using Go that long and you haven't just did type foo interface, here's some methods and now you use that. Like, I think it's good to, I think you can have people that aren't good at programming or haven't read some of the mistakes or aren't as familiar and realize, because the Go, like the Go methodology is that you receive interfaces, you return structs. And so if you don't do that, maybe they don't realize that. I programmed Go for the first three months, four months of Go on stream. I never knew that rule. Right? Who the hell doesn't know what a pointer is? Pointers are a very difficult first thing to grasp. And even when you think you get it, you kind of don't feel like you get it for a long time. I struggled with pointers for the first little bit. I like had to think about it. I had, I had to think about it for a little bit. All right, don't be a full stack developer. Choose a tech slash field and stay with it. It will make you a much better developer. All right? I just simply disagree with that, that statement in general. I don't think there's anything wrong with being familiar with a lot of spots. Now, I think you should try to be good in one specific area, but you shouldn't shy away from other areas, right? Like, I mean, right now I'm building a game and integrating Chad Gippity and integrating Twitch chat. I think it's more fun. I think life generally is more fun when you can actually do a lot of things, right? I, I think it's less fun when you're always just like, I'm the CSS God of all time, right? It's just like, I'm not sure if I, I, I don't know if you really want to be the CSS God of all time because then Tailwind comes by and then nobody's, everybody's like, I don't, I don't know who you are, CSS man. Get out of here, CSS man. And then, you know, I don't think you should put all your eggs in one little basket and then that's it. Color, red, display, absolute, top, zero, left, zero. I'm CSS. 
I am CSS. If it is the front end, put effort into NPM. Okay, that's first off. That's a crazy statement. So I wouldn't hire you if you said you want to be you want to be in front end, put effort into NPM. If that's the first thing you list as as like just like you wouldn't hire someone that doesn't understand the underlying data structure of a slice and a map. If the first thing you associate with front end is NPM, I would also not hire you because that's crazy. Put all your effort into a package manager. I know nobody cares about NPM. Nobody does. Okay, most people NPM install and then never look at it again and hope that it doesn't work. And then every now and then you delete your node modules and you reinstall it. Like that's it. Uh, SAS, I thought SAS was dead. CSS, isn't that the same thing as SAS pretty much at this point? JS, that's classic. TS, okay. HTML, odd that you would even focus on that, honestly. I'm going to be real and maybe I'm just ignorant. But I thought you just use divs when it comes to HTML. Am I wrong on that? Not for accessibility! 90% of the time, though, right? It's just divs. Am I wrong on that? It's like 99% divs, and then you have to have some accessibility ones that you want to, like, you, you put a section. And section is just, it's just div with some implied behavior. Area hidden on body tag. Not false. Example of multi-select component. Div, div hell. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I would believe that. All right. Uh, let's see. If it's back end, put effort into Go. Good choice. Postgres. Redis. Keyval. Mongo. Odd choice, Rabbit, Kafka, Docker, and at least AWS. Okay. Okay. Okay, I mean, that's just a list. I'm sure there's a lot of different lists you could really, if you wanted to do backend, you could do backend quite a few different things, right? Elixir probably. AW, honestly, if you really wanted to get good at, if you really wanted to be hired as a, as a DevOps person, probably knowing AWS is probably not a bad idea. Like re real talk, it's probably not a bad idea. Uh, technology is generally, uh, technology in general is mostly built on top of serious tools that do one thing and one thing well. Doing all will make you never deep dive in any of the topics for real, except at the cost of the other techs you know. Development stacks evolve and grow fast. Reduce the scope of what you need to keep an eye for. Edit. As in Deering. One of my statements because people forgot that in mean Deering. All right. I don't know what that means. I guess I'm not in the know. Uh, this feels like a high rant. I've just thrown that out there. I'm not in the know on in. Uh, where's Git on all this? Yeah, where the hell's Git? Uh, this was vacuous. I, I, I think the thing I'm excited about with this is that Go plus React, if, it, if that's really happening and a bunch of people are learning about a different way to think, I think this is really good. Generally speaking, for your career, understanding different, like, more strict requirements when it comes to programming, I think will always benefit you in the long run. So learning something like Odin or Zig or C, I, I think it's just, it's, it's good. It's good for you. I think you're going to be very happy that you've done it. And I think you're going to actually be able to write all your other code better because you understand a much more strict environment. Whereas like, if you only know JavaScript, I think you just kind of, you get yourself, I, I didn't put Rust in there because Rust is a little bit different. Uh, Rust, I, I, I would put Rust under a different category than the, the ones I listen. Let's see, everyone should learn C if they haven't already. I used to do a lot of C. I haven't done C in a long time, but I generally understand C. Uh, it's just all the specifics. All the foot guns, I will just get, I, I will literally walk on foot guns if I use C. Or if I have to write like uh, my own uh, multi threaded server. Like I'm just going to do terrible at it. Honestly, I will do, I just do terrible at it. Bar checker is a good concept. Bar checker is a great concept, but it's I wouldn't really call Rust a low-level language. And I think that's fair. I think that's very fair to say that Rust isn't that low level. And you're probably thinking, well, why why do you say that? Uh, most people programming Rust don't think about memory layout. So when I programmed Rust, I wasn't thinking about how I was actually aligning things. Go zig your Rust. Like when I'm doing zig, I'm like, okay. I want all of these right here. I want all of this right. Like I, I, I actually think about the memory layout, and I'm thinking about that. Whereas with with Rust, I don't necessarily think about that. I do a lot of arc mutex, right? And when you do arc mutex, you've already like you're already in some crazy land, right? You're already doing atomic reference counting. Any multi-threaded, you're you're reference counting like wild. And so once you're reference counting, to me, it's just like okay, you're no longer thinking about memory in the same in the same sense. All right, Odin will uh, literally, uh, let's see, is literally great to improve your computer science fundamentals. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm very excited. I am gonna, I am gonna do Odin. I have decided that I will. I, I'm gonna ask Ginger Bill a couple questions, just practically speaking for me, if it's a good choice or if I should continue with Zig. 
and hear his opinions on it. But that will be later. Uh, Od- uh, no, Odin is coming here shortly. Though LinkedIn can be a great place to get a job, and you could get the, the job of your dreams because a recruiter on LinkedIn. I got my job at Netflix because of LinkedIn. Okay, so I'm not saying LinkedIn's a bad place. But I think generally, the LinkedIn influencer, I haven't seen a lot of hits. There are some hits. Hey, there are some hits on the LinkedIn influencer. But I would just generally be very careful with what everything they, they, they say on LinkedIn. Okay? A lot, a lot of LLM content out there. Should I become a LinkedIn influencer? How, okay, what, 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 was a good, what was like a good first post? How do I do this? How do I do this? What's like what's a good one? Okay, let's 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 start a post here. Let's let's think about this. Okay, so how how are we gonna do this? Um, you know, I have seen a lot of people asking me whether they should learn C, Go, Rust, TypeScript, Odin, Zig, or some other exotic exotic language. The answer is not just what language to learn, but which language can you tell the most people about that you use? JavaScript, you don't really tell people. Zig, at least one by the way. Rust, you change your hairstyle. Right? Like each one is more and more important. Do you see how they each are becoming more and more? Right? So the answer is clearly, clearly Rust. Is that how you did? Did I do a good job with? Did I do a good job with that post? Again! 